Well, um, I hope you'll take your Bible. Last week we looked at some scripture that suggested for me at least 15 points. And I promised you a list of those, so we have complete points around the bulletin board out here. And uh, if only a couple of you go out there, there's more than enough copies, I think. You can just take a copy that's on the bulletin board. The points from last week. We're going to do something daring and continue on from there. We looked at 15 points as regarding this verse in Ephesians and one or two related verses, Ephesians chapter 3 and uh, verse 13. And uh, breaking perhaps several laws of homiletics uh, and spending, starting over, let's look, or starting another verse, let's look again at verse 13 in Ephesians 3 where it says, Paul writing, Wherefore, he says, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Again, wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. What's going on here? Is he talking about giving a kidney or something? What is he doing about sacrifice here and doing it for someone? What are tribulations? Well, we can uh, define tribulations in a way as those great things that uh, sometimes we face that are trials, uh, burdens. Uh, among our 15 points, we found out, or we have listed the thought, that certainly that these tribulations spoken of here by Paul are real, they are not imaginary. Um, to deny something's existence because we choose to deny it, it is a dangerous thing to do, whether it be with the technicalities of theology or the matters of our own troubles, tribulation. One of the first steps has got to be, like when it comes to the matter of our salvation, is to admit our need. And to acknowledge our helplessness and our hopelessness without that need being met by God. Here in verse 13, Paul is confessing the way that there are tribulations. They are not just for the poor people and the weak people, they are for apostles. And if we have time this morning to look at verses that speak about how the Lord suffered. Who are we to think that if he suffered, that we might not suffer? If he faced tribulation, might we not also have tribulation, those that didn't use the word deserve? Sometimes, no doubt, there are reasons why we might deserve tribulation. I'm not talking again about that end time period often identified as seven years of tribulation. I'm talking here about everyday living and everyday suffering, and many of us do it. Suffer, that is. In our verse, Paul is conscious that others are aware. Maybe this is part of the responsibility of holding the office that he does. Maybe he knew many other celebrities today should look at the effects, the consequences of their own living, their life choices, their reputation. Paul was conscious of his reputation. He was conscious of how others would observe his condition. He was doing a great thing and answering the call of God to do so. But he was suffering in it to some extent, some very serious suffering. And he wanted those, his loved ones, both family and friends, we don't know about much family for Paul, but we know that there were many, many around the empire that knew of this little man, Paul, and his great adventures for God and what he had suffered. Paul, by the way, is a word meaning little. We don't know much about Paul in many ways. But he was indeed a great one as far as suffering for his God. I'd like to direct your attention to a passage, the passage we read, our brother Edmund read, from Philippians in chapter 2, Philippians. And there we have an introduction really to a man so wonderful. Paul himself appreciated him so highly, he praises him hugely. His name was Epaphroditus. Um, this is uh, Philippians chapter 2. And beginning at verse 25, Paul says, Yet I thought it necessary to send unto you Epaphroditus, my brother, and he goes on. Epaphroditus, I have a belief, a uh, conviction that people of that era were not different from our own. They're saddled by their parents with an, uh, an atrocious name with many syllables. Other kids would no doubt uh, give them a nickname. Uh, I don't know if Epaphroditus, by the way, Jesus, Jesus name means salvation. Um, how many Jesuses are there in the world? How many just in Venezuela for that? There are across the world, reflected a little bit differently, no doubt, probably from the name that 
Jesus was named that by others, his parents, etc. There are millions and millions of Jesuses. It should be a name very precious to us because it was the name of our Lord Jesus. Uh, Paphroditus, maybe it was called Pappy, or maybe it was called Ra, that's the R O D in the middle of this word. Uh, other things might occur to you, these strange names strike me, and I think about how nicknames have always been, and people have always abbreviated and shorted, what is your nickname? Yes, I'd like to hear later, please. At verse uh, 25, Paul says, I thought it necessary to send to you people of, of, of the I almost said it again, I almost said the Philippines. To you people of the of Philippi, verse 25, to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother. He is my brother. By the way, again, we know almost nothing about the Apostle Paul's background. He was hugely Jewish. He, of course, had parents, as everyone coming into this world has somehow parents. I conjectured you last week near the end of the message that with all the infamy that was really in many people's eyes regarding Paul, that maybe his mother, if she still lived, would be shaking her head to think of the notoriousness of her boy, her son, her boy. <coughs> we don't know. We are pretty sure, we, I, as far as I know, we know nothing about siblings, brothers or sisters. So here, the use of the name brother or the title brother is of a spiritual brotherhood here in this case. We have a spiritual man in Paul, and somehow there was a relationship between Paul and Aphrodite that Paul um, uh, identified as being so very close that Aphrodite was worthy of the name brother. Sometimes we use that term or sister a little carelessly. But oh, how wonderful it is to have both physical brothers and those who are then are not physical brothers of the flesh or the same parentage, but have a commonality, a oneness. And apparently, Epaphroditus and Paul had this in common. And so, Paul, without hesitation, called him my brother. And then he says, companion in labor. If you have worked with uh, great strenuousness at some occupation or vocation, be it short or long, or perhaps you remember, that relationship had a, a, a binding in it that made to one, perhaps, as efforts went into one great effort towards some goal. Apparently, Epaphroditus and Paul had this. Paul called him my brother and companion in labor. And notice fellow soldier, which is a revealing thought. Because indeed, as far as we know, Paul was never uh, part of the Roman Empire's army or any tribute of any other nationality on the fringes of the empire or the, of the Jews themselves. He was not, he was active, he was vigorous, but he was not I think, in the military. But he calls Epaphroditus a fellow soldier, which should probably suggest to us that there might well be a little more health in us as believers as we looked at ourselves a little more martially, let me say. That the faith is, in this world and in this time, a war. It won't be that way as we graduate someday to heaven, but in this world today, there are elements of warfare that are very much like the elements of what true living in Christ is about. I am personally very much for military, and I have a care about military people, but I'm a very non-martial type person. I did not like any bit of the time I spent in the military. Some 30, now 40 years ago I was in the military. But notice Paul puts this clearly here, Epaphroditus is a fellow soldier of mine. Like we consider ourselves then, since we, each of them were soldiers of the faith, are we soldiers like they were soldiers, or soldiers at all? Is there something so serious and vital about the faith in Jesus Christ that it is very fitting that we looked at as something that is of a, almost a military nature? Is there a battle? Is there a warfare to be preparing for and to be fought? Paul considered Epaphroditus to be a soldier, a fellow soldier to him, implying again that both Paul and Epaphroditus were soldiers. Further, he identifies him, but as your messenger, maybe a small distortion of my usual blessed buts, but there's the word but, 
Paul wants the recipients to know that he recognizes that Epaphroditus was a messenger. Who from? From the people of Philippi. It appears that Epaphroditus was a native and part of the church of Philippi. And that because they had concern for Paul, they had decided to send Epaphroditus to Paul to help him in ministry, to help him serve. And so, we'll read the circumstances here. Paul looks at Epaphroditus and notice all of these wonderful positive things about him and his experience with him, but notes that he was actually on a mission, that he was a messenger for service sake from Philippi to Paul. And right now Paul is, yes, in prison. Epaphroditus has been there. He's been in the cell. He's been following up as closely as he can Paul. Paul appreciates it. He says to the people of Philippi, your messenger to me has been a blessing. Notice it says, he that ministered to my need. If you want to prove yourself a lover of another, of use to another, minister to their needs. Think about that when Paul says at the end of verse 25, he ministered to my need. You would think that of the church today in some spheres, that there are many with uh, gold and uh, all sorts of jewelry involved in, the, in their hierarchical place as they in all their finery supposedly represent God or are substitutes for God. And they have no need. There's plenty of money in some of these, of these churches. But we know here that Paul was in need. And I suggest to you there is no shame to be in need. Paul can be looked at as our example of this. Notice his confession. Confession. We don't have to have to fight to look at him as being a normal man in need. He confesses it himself. In my need. How do we show this? Verse 26. For a long after you all. Here's something I've noticed about Epaphroditus lately, says Paul. I've noticed his longing for you. Is it homesickness? Is it just plain old homesickness? And verse 26. Full of heaviness, it showed in his life with what he seemed to be burdened with concerning this. Why? Verse 26, really think about this. Because you have heard that he has been sick. Now let me interject a little thought here. Thank you, cards. I did this in the first service this morning. I even I have quite a few books. And one of the books I have, believe it or not, is just the total topic is writing thank you cards. Which maybe I need to follow more closely because I'm so clumsy at it. I, I, I'm just, I think I'm like many males, M A L E S S, who find it difficult to feel that that's the means of expressing thanks and to do it as I think is more maybe, I'm maybe prejudiced, the female tendency to do it. For instance, if you come my way and you treat me so special and wonderful or help in some way, I'm probably going to say, thank you. I'm going to say, thank you very much. I'm going to somehow try to express that orally and make you know my thankfulness by that means, but I may well not follow that up with a written thank you note. I, I have this real prejudice. I think, why? You didn't believe my words that I was thankful? You, you know me, you've been good to me, but you think I need really to put it in writing? Do I need to have it notarized, by the way, that I feel thankful? No, I, I look at it and think to myself, well, someone who has blessed me, uh, blessed me, myself alone, it's not by representing others, but saying that my word that I have been blessed and I'm thankful should be sufficient. For to do otherwise, in many ways, is sort of, <coughs> may I demonstrate, you know the title of this message is The Limp and the Limber. Maybe I should define that for us. The limp, that's what you get when you put a nickel in your shoe, or it drops in there, and you tie up your shoe, and you start walking around, you start getting a blister, and you limp as a result. Maybe you are in an act or a play or some movie, and you have a part of someone, remember old gun smoke? His name is our man, Marshal Matt Dillon. One of the other characters of the old Gunsmoke show for decades, back in the 60s and 70s, was a character named Chester, 
who really rock life is played by a guy who died a couple years ago named Dennis Weaver, to play Chester because Chester had a limp. He would bind up his limp leg as part of being an actor, and he would limp around, and he was a character that everybody loved, if you ever saw the old show. Well, <clears throat> a limp is a pain, a trial, a tribulation. It is something that is affecting. And a limper, believe it or not, I had to look this up in the dictionary to see it should not be limp -y. I thought, oh, these folks in my, my church, you know, the city of the print, they're going to doubt whether that should be there. Limp and the limpy, or limp and the limper. <sighs> limper is correct, I guess. I, I found uh, limper. So it's the limp and the limper. And the limper is someone who is suffering and going to trial and trouble. Paul is that. He is a limper. He's not all free flow flowing. He's not showing ballet artistry. He is showing his age. He's showing his pain when he has suffered. Ephesians 3 verse 13, he's trying to be careful and considerate. And he's saying to these of Philippi, don't plead, oh, the, of Ephesians, by the way, Ephesians 3.13. He's saying, please do not take this wrong. It is true, but don't take this as something that you should be affected by. It's part of the plan of God. Now we have here Paul talking about Epaphroditus. He ministered to our need, my need. He longed after you all and was full of heaviness. What was the reason? Verse 26. Because you have heard that he had been sick. I think to myself, Randy, uh, I'm just a face-to-face -face observant. Those words, they seem to be rather effeminate to me. I mean, concern, maybe a little concerned about where the daily bread's coming from. Maybe a little concerned about shelter for the night. But here, concern that others might, on hearing of illness, be somehow moved by that unduly. That is a big issue. And does it come concerning of 